recording. And we will start welcoming uh, people into this round table with picks. So um, just a heads up to our audience who's joining. Uh, we'll be starting in just a few minutes. We're expecting over 60 people at today's <laughs> round table. And uh, Tori, you're, you're in charge of picks. What exactly is picks? Well, PICS is a group of uh, creative and innovative individuals, um, primarily from the Lehigh Valley, with a, and it was started from pre-treatment coordinators from the Easton, Allentown, Bethlehem, and Catasauqua area, and has evolved over the years into a 501c3 based on funds set aside by EPA um, to help point source and indirect dischargers discharge um, and implement and develop and share innovative and effective pretreatment technologies and best management practices for networking and fun innovative events like we have today. So, yeah, so this is the first round table you guys are doing, right? Absolutely. Normally we do an annual. Many of the people who are in the audience um, are frequent visitors of our annual um, seminar that we have at uh, the Bethlehem Steel Stacks um, uh, Arts Quest every year. Unfortunately, um, due to COVID, our friend, uh, we weren't able to do it live, but we thought a very creative way was to use the very talented um, resources that Christine, our moderator, has put together and do a live round table. So we're super excited everybody can be here today. Yeah, so uh, on the panel, is everyone here on the panel? Are you guys all members of PIX? <laughs> or is there some guests out there? We have some guests for sure. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Because uh, I know the panels that we do here at NTech, we love highlighting NTech's engineering and operator skills and abilities, but it's, it's our friends. It's our industry friends, the suppliers and contractors and even other engineers we love getting their viewpoints uh, on these different topics. And, you know, since we're stuck at home <laughs> so much right now and can't do conferences, where you get face to face, get to hug people and interact. This is the closest we've come to getting there. And, and sometimes it, it really feels like we're, the 10 of us are together in a room. So it's pretty magical. So a reminder to our audience, people tuning in, uh, we will be taking questions from you guys. This is all about you, your needs, what you're dealing with out there uh, and questions for uh, our panel. There's a Q&A button that's part of Zoom. Find the Zoom menu on your screen and please submit questions throughout. Uh, that's the basis of these roundtables and that's what makes them so fun, making sure we're um, really um, delving deep into your concerns and seeing how we can best help you, plus sharing that information with each other. Uh, so Tori, how long have you been involved with PICS? Well, I'm um, one of the original founding members. Um, PICS originally began in the uh, mid 1990s. Oh my God, I'm dating myself. And um, we became a 501c3 in 2005. Um, we took a, a one year hiatus um, around uh, 2018 um, to really reinvent ourselves and, and rethink our, our mission and um, direction moving forward. Thus, this, this meeting is just so important important to us as a group. We've gathered some new board members, which are absolutely amazing, and I'll share those with you here in a minute, and um, re, uh, reinvented our website, um, thanks to our good friends at EarthRes, and um, we just, we're super excited to get right back out there, you know, in the, um, in the industry and, and help out and network in any way we can. So looking forward to great things from the PICS team. Okay, I see we're up at 11 o'clock, so let's kick things off. Uh, just a few things of note that I want to share with uh, the audience out there. Uh, if you've been to any of NTEC's roundtables, you know, you know the spiel. Uh, but if this is new to you, um, the overview of what we'll be doing today, 60 minutes long. Uh, we're very cognizant of your time and how valuable it is. So I will be stopping at noon. However, if there's still questions, uh, we'll continue with the panel discussion, uh, and if, but if you have to leave, you're welcome to. Uh, please submit your questions and comments throughout. Uh, if you have answers that our panel doesn't, we'd love to read them out loud and share them with everyone. So use the Q&A button that's part of the Zoom screen. For best viewing, we've got a lot of people on the panel today. So there's 10 boxes total. You have the option, top right side, there's a toggle menu. You can either pick speaker view or grid view, uh, they're um, aspects of Zoom. Try both 
uh, grid is fun if you want to see everyone's faces, but speaker may be good. You don't, don't want to be inundated with so many faces and you can just concentrate on who's speaking. Put your cell phone away. Uh, panelists, make sure it's on silent. Make sure mine is. Um, put it away, turn it upside down, take a break. You need a little break. These roundtables are always engaging and educational. Yeah, Whatever is on your phone can wait. <laughs> Uh, there will be a recording available on the PICS website afterwards. So if you miss any part of it, kind of share it with friends and family. You'll be able to watch the recording there. And so let's kick things off. So this is the PICS, the Pre-Treatment Information Exchange, Lehigh Valley. Pre-treatment gone viral. The good, the bad, and the ugly. If you want more information on PICS, their website is www.lvpics.org. So what to expect today? We'll do an introduction to PICS. Corey Morgan from NTech Engineering will take care of that. Big thanks to our sponsor, that's Tom Poehler with EarthRes. Uh, he'll speak a few minutes about his company and how he, can, he and they can help you. The format of the round table, I'll introduce the panel. We'll do a poll question. We really like to focus on what your needs are out there in the audience. So we'll do a poll question to let us know where to focus and what you guys are concerned about. And then throughout, we'll be taking questions and comments from you through the Q&A button on your Zoom screen. And finally, we'll do a wrap up right around noon. Uh, we will be sharing all the panelists' names, their email addresses. There'll be some final words from Tori Morgan. And then when you sign off, there's gonna be a survey. PICS is very interested in doing more of these roundtables and making sure they're meeting your needs. So it's a, I think it's just a quick two question survey. You could help us uh, with some feedback. It'd be very much appreciated and only take a minute of your time. So to kick things off, whoops, <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And Tori, do you wanna give us an introduction to PICS? I would love to. Thank you, Christine. And, and Christine, thank you for being our moderator today. We really do appreciate your guidance and support. Um, everybody, welcome. Welcome back to PICS. Um, as many of you know, I think some of you have been involved in PICS um, seminars in the past. Um, PICS is a, was originally a group of pretreatment coordinators from the um, Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton, and Catasauqua area and evolved over the years into a 501c3 group of individuals um, in the industry. They might be a combination of industry leaders, pretreatment coordinators, um, residents, you know, just general um, uh, individuals that are interested in the industry to help promote um, pretreatment technologies and education through networking and seminars. And we've had some very interesting seminars over the years. Um, in 2018, PICS took a bit of a hiatus to reinvent itself and gather new board members. And we're very, very excited to say that as of 2020, this year, we're back on track, a new website, um, thanks to EarthRes and their support. Um, so please, if you get a chance, check it out. Like Christine had said, we'll have that available for you. W www.lvpix.org. Um, I did want to mention that um, we are just so blessed to have some amazing board members. I just want to throw their names out real quick. Um, we have Alex Hoffman. Um, she's our vice president with the city of Easton. We have Katie Vilecki. She's our treasurer with Lehigh Valley Health Network. Tom Pular, our secretary with EarthRes. We have Chris Cope from Keystone Engineering. Karen Dancho, she's retired from the city of Bethlehem. She's another founding member. We have Mark Gradwell with Northeast Technical Sales, Kara Humes with Entech Engineering. Um, we have Frank Lasagio with Drager Medical, Andrew Moore with Lehigh County Authority, Christian Torres with the City of Bethlehem, and finally myself, Tori Morgan, I'm the Acting President for PICS. Um, I couldn't do this, any of this, without the amazing team and board we have at PICS, and we are thrilled to have you all here today, and I hope you enjoy the roundtable. So to get things started, I'd like to introduce Tom Pular with EarthRes, and they are this roundtable's um, sponsor this year. Welcome, Tom. Hi, Tori. Thank you, and good morning, Lehigh Valley. Are you ready for another Zoom call? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I promise this one will be good. I do promise that. My name is Tom Pular. I'm Senior Project Manager and Industrial Sector Leader at EarthRes. EarthRes is proud to sponsor this first PICS roundtable, and we appreciate you joining us. EarthRes, this is our commercial, so that's, that's since we get the lead off. EarthRes is an engineering science-oriented consulting firm with a staff of 75 engineers, geologists, and scientists who are located in offices in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. I've been working with EarthRes for over 20 years, 
and I've been in the environmental engineering field for 40 years. Some say that makes me old. I prefer to say I'm experienced. I have an undergraduate degree from Penn State, a graduate degree from Villanova, and I'm a licensed professional engineer in three states, including Pennsylvania. I truly enjoy the work and, and I'm proud of the projects and clients I've worked with over the years. Um, I, I, I'm supposed to start the slideshow now, but I'm just gonna pass on that. We'll save you all that. EarthRes is attended and presented at the annual PIX conference in years past. As I tell people, it's one of the few shows that is fun to attend with friendly people willing to talk with you and superior technical information. The goal is to benefit all participants. When the conference was canceled in 2019 and PIX put the call out for volunteers, I jumped at the opportunity and I volunteered at EarthRes to help restart the PIX organization with new logo website and social media presence. For my efforts, I was rewarded with being voted onto the PIX board as secretary. And that's a good thing, right, Tori? You keep you keep saying that. I we keep telling we keep telling Tom that you go with that. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, getting aside, I I believe strongly in the PIX initiatives, and with a way to work with the region and businesses to help preserve and improve water resources in the Lehigh Valley. We work with industrial, commercial, municipal clients to manage regulatory compliance needs, design facility improvements, and meet sustainability initiatives. There's, there's, I know there's some clients out there that we have now and we hope we're, that there's some new ones listening. For now, I just wanna send out this reminder. Um, Semi-annual new source performance standard reports are due January 30th. Semi-annual Title V monitoring reports are due January 30th. AIMS and Tier 2 reports due March 1st. Residual waste generator reports due March 1st. Greenhouse gas reporting due March 31st. And also, have you updated your spill plan recently? Are you ready? Just want to make sure. Um, so if you have any questions, please check out our Earth site, www.earthres.com, or contact me directly. I'm looking forward to meeting all of you and working with you. And for now, I will turn it back over to Christine. Tom, you still have 20 seconds. No, oh, I'll, I'll do the slideshow. <laughs> no, go ahead. Save there. Thank you so, so much, Tom. We really appreciate it. I'm going to switch you over to be an attendee, but I know uh, PIX is so grateful for you guys being a sponsor for our first uh, first roundtable. So thank you. Um, so I want to kick things off by sharing with the audience uh, what we're looking at as far as our roundtable panel. So uh, first, I'm Christine Gonzalez. I am with Entech Engineering, and my business card says that I am a storage tank queen. Go. <laughs> and it's, it's true. So I deal with tanks all the time. Um, what I love about the panel that you guys put together is it really highlights the variety of experience and uh, just how all the participants, they come from different angles. So we've got regulatory, we've got authorities, we've got engineers, there's industrial businesses. So I, I love the variety here. Uh, and we'll kick it off with Maggie Green. She's an environmental engineer with the EPA, the pretreatment program there. Andrew Moore, he's the compliance manager with the Lehigh County Authority. Alex Hoffman is the assistant operations manager and industrial pretreatment manager with the Easton Area Joint Sewer Authority. Katie Balecki is the senior sus sustainability specialist with the Lehigh Valley Health Network. Also have Andy Schneck, he's the facility and security manager with Fanatics Majestic. My colleague, Tori Morgan, joined Entech Engineering back in the summer, and she's our Compliance Coordinator and Senior Project Manager. Diana Heimbach is the Project Manager with Jacobs Engineering and Lehigh County Authority Wastewater Pretreatment Facility. And finally, Justine Maurer is the Regional Environmental Manager at Beambo Bakeries USA. So welcome, panel. I mentioned we want to just kick things off with a poll for our audience. And this help us, helps us to focus on what your concerns are, uh, what your needs are, what you guys are struggling with. So the question we want to pose to you guys is, what COVID-related issues have been the most challenging for you? Uh, you're welcome to fill in, uh, pick, pick several different ones if you want to, uh, but this will help us to know where we want to focus our conversation today and how, how the panel can best help you with that. 
So I'll give you another 10 seconds to fill in some answers there. I think we are all relieved to hear good news about vaccines coming out. So hoping maybe by the summertime we can get things back to normal. Uh, but in the meantime, <laughs> how are we gonna get through the next six months? <laughs> Okay, uh, so another second and I will stop the polling. Okay, and I'm gonna share the results with everybody. So it looks like the number one thing, ah, interesting, keeping the personnel healthy. So that had 42%. Uh, number two, or two was the creating and implementing new procedures and protocols as well as, and then the employee, employee morale, those look very, very close. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you to the audience that really, really helps us to know uh, where we should focus things. So, speaking of that, keeping personnel healthy. <laughs> um, who on the panel uh, wants to share some experience? What has your firm, industry, what have you seen out there? What are you guys doing to keep your personnel healthy? Who wants to kick things off? So I'll, pick some, I'll pick somebody. Tori, oh. go ahead. <laughs> no, I, actually, let Justine go first. I, okay, Justine. Uh, okay. Okay, great. Um, so uh, working at Bimbo Bakeries, when we, you know, heard everything about COVID and everyone started working remotely, the people that, you know, were deemed essential um, at the plant, what, what we did was we installed um, these, they actually look like little pandas. It's a little camera that that takes your temperature as soon as you walk in. Um, and then we just um, expanded more PPE uh, protocols. So, you know, just wearing masks and things like that. And uh, I mean, washing washing your hands was already a thing that we did um, prior to entering the, the plant, um, but we just emphasized that. Um, other people, what are you guys doing out there to keep your employees healthy? Tori? Mine was, mine was a question also for like Justine and, and maybe, um, you know, some of the others on the call is, you know, in regards to keeping your employees healthy, did you, I'm curious if you found an issue with employees being out and meeting the requirements that you had to do, whether it be sampling or like just general maintenance, things that would impact you from a compliance standpoint. Was that was that an issue? Was that ever something that you fell behind or became a challenge um, in regards to keeping your employees healthy if they were if they ended up being sick or being out of work? I'm just curious. Just um, so so for us, uh, we did we did experience that at first, um, but we we always have someone. We have a backup. We always have a you know a backup person uh, who would kind of step in to take place. Um, but we also did notice that uh, regulatory was a little bit more flexible at the beginning of COVID. Uh, you know when everybody was trying to figure everything out, trying to get things sorted. Uh, they were a little bit, bit more flexible with working with us um, to get on tr back on track with things like that. Have you noticed them getting harsher now? Um, <laughs> no, not, not not yet. Knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't want to jinx it. Andrew, you would call that? <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, we, we've used a lot of different technology in our different sites. We've, uh, you know, as far as keeping our employees safe, we were able to, you know, do something similar, Justine, with uh, like an iPad that takes your temperature. We've also used some technology where you use a camera that will take a, uh, up to 30 people's temperature at one time. Um, you know, just really upgraded our, our processes. Uh, a lot of contact tracing has been really key as of late. Um, but mm -hmm. one of the things that we dealt with was we had a large uh, reduction in our workforce. Uh, even though we kept working, we still had a large reduction in, in our, our water usage dropped probably uh, 30% and we weren't operating some of the functions that we had been that that's part of the pretreatment process. So, um, you know, our process has changed and we had to adapt into a, a new method what we were doing on site. And, uh, you know, that obviously changed some of the results and some of the things that, that we see on a quarterly basis. Did any, anyone else out there notice the same sort of thing just by people working in different ways or different places? Alex, were you, yeah, you're nodding your head, go ahead. 
We really focused on cross training. So we made sure our employees were trained all abroad so that if somebody was out, we had somebody else to fill in in other departments that they never would have worked in before. So it was all hands on deck. <laughs> was that successful? Is that And it sounds like that's even good for the future, no matter it, what happens, right? It is for sure. And you know what? We learned a lot. <laughs> like, like what? What sort of things did you learn? So I spent a lot of time in the lab, which was my old pastime. So it was kind of my, my current and my past coming together. So helping the lab staff work and to be honest, I was cleaning toilets from all the way to doing my normal job just because we didn't have personnel. Wow, that's excellent. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Diana, you had something to share about protecting uh, personnel? Uh, yeah, so what, what we're doing here is we have, um, we have a small crew here, but we split our team into two. So we have like a team A and a team B and we never cross. So there's um, somebody from every department in each crew and between um, from day to day. So we're, we're not here 24 seven, we're here 12 hours a day. So from day to day, if the teams change, there's a whole sanitation process that sort of happens between shifts. Um, additionally, I had a call with several of the local industries earlier this week. And one of them said that they were using like stickers that it, to put um, on high touch areas to help with the sanitation efforts. So any area, I mean, some things are obvious, right? Doorknobs and, and handrails, but any area that they felt was high touch in their industry, they had stickers on so that when they did go through and sanitize, they made sure that they hit those areas for sure. Just because, you know, you can get a little complacent when you start doing that over and over again. So it's a reminder of those high touch areas. I thought that was a good idea. I haven't implemented it here yet, but I, I did think that was pretty clever. Excellent. Yeah, anyone else out there seeing um, tips and tricks like that so we don't get complacent? Anyone doing anything um, that you wanna share with the, the audience here? Okay, I'm, uh, I'm curious. Yeah. I'm, I was curious, Christine, from the from the standpoint of, of the use of, of contract laboratories and contractors, which are involved very much with pretreatment and industrial related activities. Um, how how have you seen an issue? And are you guys um, from a from a contact standpoint, has that gone smoothly? Um, have you found that it's not going smoothly? And what are you doing to address that? I'm, I know that everybody who deals in this industry basically deals with contractors in some way, shape or form. Yeah, I can comment on that. We have been taking all of our samples and putting them into coolers and just placing everything outside. We've been taping the chains to the lid. And um, when our contract laboratory comes to pick everything up, we don't even have to see them. If there's any issues or anything like that, they can give us a call. Um, the other side of that is we do have an on-site laboratory and we also run the water and the wastewater plant. So between both plants, there's a total of five lab techs and we've did basically what Diana said, where we split crews and that we made them, you know, strictly at one plant. Um, so there's no going back and forth and hopefully we don't have any issues, but in that event, we would still have a crew that isn't contaminated. Other comments on that uh, question from Tori? Okay, um, so back to this idea of the uh, cross training. Uh, Alex had some really interesting sort of lessons learned and just the value in doing it with your employees uh, in a situation like this. Um, anyone else have uh, experience, anyone else doing cross training or making sure your employees are cross trained? Okay. <laughs> I, I think, um, I think, you know, one of the things with, with the cross training, which is interesting to me um, from the pretreatment standpoint and from an, you know, from an industrial side, you know, probably geared more towards, um, you know, Justine and, and, and Katie and Andrew um, and, you know, from the industry side is, you know, there's a lot of things that, that, that we, that you would do on a daily basis that you might not easily be able to cross train um, different individuals for, I mean, cause these are, these are technical positions. I mean, the people who are taking the samples, the people who are doing the reports and, and things like that. So, you know, I guess that comes back to the original question and, and maybe Maggie can chime in on this one as well. You know, there obviously has to be some sort of a, um, a a relationship and a flexibility that has to have happened from the onset of COVID for getting reports in or maybe delayed sampling um, from an industry side or even from the IPP um, manager side. And, and I'm curious um, 
with all of you and, and Maggie, um, has that continued or do we see that kind of dropping off and we're going back to a new normal? And now that unfortunately, because COVID seems to be ramping up again, are we re reinstituting some of those um, flexibilities and um, a, you know, for industries to be able to um, get back and forth with what they need to do? I think you're just trying to get me into the conversation, Tori. <laughs> good at that aren't I Maggie? You are. Um, you know I think many of you are aware of the temporary enforcement discretion policy that EPA put out back in March that was it, it ended at the end of August and I think um, you know regarding anything especially with COVID there is an understanding that this is a public health pandemic and and I think you've got to keep that in mind, especially when something's coming up that potentially is a commitment you can't meet. And I would say the best thing you can do is to keep the line of communication open with your regulators. Um, you know, obviously there's there can only be flexibility if we are aware of it and are able to offer compliance assistance in any way, shape or form. That being said, I, I don't, I can't speak for OECA or ECAT or EPA headquarters, but there's always gonna be enforcement discretion um, and a lot of understanding considering the pandemic. And there are a number of um, resources we've put out, but I think at the end of the day, you know, one of our main things that's been iterated in a number of our documents that we've sent out publicly has been, you know, you know we recommend doing stuff as long as it is safe um, to do so and we're not, you know, it, there is no harsh gavel of you must go out. It's there is a lot of understanding, but you know, at the same time, you have to continue to do your best to maintain your commitments and compliance. And then, if not, there needs to be appropriate, you know, documentation and justification as to why not. And that's what really is going anyone at EPA will be looking for, at least as far as if you're regulated by us. But you know, as it's passed down, that's what we're looking at. I'm curious, Maggie, like what percentage of the people or of the you know, industries and people out there that do work with the EPA, how many of them have needed a little bit of help or some leniency? Is it a big percentage or just a small percentage? Um, we've gotten a lot of inquiries since March. Um, you know, I'd say it's probably around 50% or a little below 50. You know, I think most people, um, They've, they've figured it out. We've we've sent out, we have an email list. So if you ever wanna get on that, um, we, gen, we generally tend to send out any new um, documents that are issued that are pertinent to anyone within the pretreatment realm. Um, so if you wanna be on that, my contact information will be up later and we can always add anyone to that email list so that you are aware of, of anything that's coming down, especially related to COVID. Um, but yeah, we have gotten a lot of in inquiries, um, many of which have been related to inspections. Because of course, you know, getting on site is um, especially key in the pretreatment program, and um, with COVID, that's that has been, I think, one of the biggest hurdles that I've seen for most people. Excellent. Any other comments from the uh, other panelists on what you just heard there? Okay. A uh, reminder to our audience: we want questions from you guys. We want your questions, concerns. Uh, please use the Q and A button. Submit them throughout, and we do have one question. Uh, this is from Tom. You may remember him. He's our sponsor with Earthres. <laughs> and Tom posed the question, is anyone doing increased testing of personnel? Especially now, COVID rates seem to be rising and, you know, the governor tells us to you know, work from home. So any new testing, increased testing of personnel? And I, I'll speak for NTech. Um, Corey, you remember we just got an email, I think a few days ago from Tanner, who's in charge of our COVID task team. Now we have a thermometer. When you go in the office, everyone has to ha ha take their temperature, record it, uh, and just really tracking people a lot more closely in that way. So that's something an engineering firm's doing. Uh, what about the rest of you? Any uh, other increased testing that you're doing out there? Or, or, and it's not just you. What are you seeing out there? Anybody else? Uh, Andrew. Yeah. So one of the things that, that we are looking into doing is where you require before an employee comes back to work that had been positive, we require them to have a negative test. However, there's been some pushback because of the influx of uh, people getting tested. 
that we are actually looking to do some testing on our own. There is a process where they can spit into a vial and uh, we don't have to touch it. They bag it, goes into a bag, it goes into a package and we send it in. So anybody that's dealing with a situation where you require something on site um, or you're not getting the, the, uh, uh, the needs met from the providers, because we're seeing uh, five, six days uh, on a return from, from uh, the medical sites that they're getting tested at. It's, I think they're just overrun with, with um, you know, trying to manage it for, for all of our, you know, all of our different situations. So there is the opportunity to do that, some of that testing yourself. You don't have to be necessarily specially trained. Just follow a certain protocol and you can uh, ship it in, mail it in and, and get some results back pretty quickly. Mm, yeah, excellent. Yeah, I, I think with you, know, you, it's something for everyone to be aware of with cases rising and more firms requiring more testing, it's going to be harder to get tests arranged and harder to or get fast results. So just being aware of that and making that part of your planning. Anyone, anyone seeing troubles like that out there? Maggie, you're, you're laughing. Uh, is, is it something else? Okay. My dog. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We need a little levity nowadays. <laughs> um, so uh, any other comments when it comes to additional testing for employees? Any other comments? I bet Katie has something to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> I can say a lot. <laughs> Katie, talk, talk, that's why you're here. What, what are you seeing, what are you doing? So we actually, uh, every morning we start off, uh, everyone will get, uh, anyone who's working that day, you'll get a text message. Um, where you have to go in into an app and then it asks you a series of questions if you've um, been in contact with someone, if you've had like a higher temperature or anything out of the normal, you know, any of those symptoms, um, then, you know, yes or no. And if it's yes, um, then they ask you to follow up with employee health. And no is just, okay, here's your pass for the day. Um, and then you go in always with PPE as soon as, um, as, soon as you get there. Um, and increase PPE on the units themselves, and even more in procedure areas. Um, and then on the, the visitor side, we're taking temperatures at the door, and you have to go through the questions, and you get a little uh, sticker that you have been screened. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of steps that have, have been working. <laughs> mm. One question I always have is, how much is all this costing? It just sort of baffles my mind to all this stuff you got, the PPE, the, the testing gizmos, and just the time involved in coming up with these, these systems and stuff. Uh, Katie, any sense of that? And like, how do you fit into your budget and all that? I'm, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> um, I know they're um, just getting the PPE is, is insane. Our supply chain folks are really working really hard to get all the stuff needed for to keep our, our hospital staff safe. Um, that's, that's really important. Um, but I'm not sure of cost, but I know, you know, it's gotta be a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Justine, I saw you smiling when it comes to the idea of cost and the time involved. What, what are you guys, uh, how are you managing all that? Uh, so I don't personally manage any other budget, um, but um, I know that we went through changes in PPE so um, the plant that's nearest to me is uh, the Lehigh plant, and they went through a, a couple of weeks where they actually had ordered various types of masks. So they did, you know, the over the face, and then they did like the turtleneck thing, um, and they had several employees try them out um, for, for days at a time to see if, you know, which one they liked better, which one worked uh, best, you know, in, in the, in the plants and being that some employees are closer to the ovens, it gets hotter if they could deal with the heat and things like that. So I'm sure that, um, that wasn't cheap and, but it, but, um, as far as, as ordering it, um, it, it seemed like the, the company as a whole did a really great job in, in just making sure that everyone had um, enough PPE to go around. Yeah, and it sounds like that's something, once again, in the future, the uh, next, next you know, four or six months, really focus on where you're gonna get that from. Uh, Tori, it looks like you're raising mm -hmm. your hand. Mm -hmm. 
it, it, it revolves around PPE. I'm curious, um, you know, just from my days back in the day when we would actually do, we would go out to the industry um, when I was with Easton and, you know, we would do the sampling. Um, you know, obviously sometimes the samplers, the were in, in the business itself, they weren't outside. And, and Alex, you probably can talk to this a little bit and Andrew. Um, and, you know, are you finding now to get because of the increased PPE and the increased concerns of COVID and, and contact, are, are you able to get into the industries to do your sampling? Is there increased measures that need to take place? And, and obviously it takes more time. Um, you know, I'm just curious how that's working now and how you guys are putting, what you're putting in place to address that for the future. Alex. We were actually making a pre phone call to every industry to find out what their required PPE is, what their protocols were, whether we had to get temperature checks, where we needed to check in because everything changed across the board. So we wanted to make sure we had all the proper PPE when we got there so they didn't have to provide us with their PPE. I felt that was very important that we were prepared and they didn't have to provide it to us. So we tried our best to make phone calls and reach out to everybody prior to going to each facility. And it sounds like things change. So you still we want to continue doing that sort of thing uh, to make sure you're, you guys are prepared, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and, Andrew, uh, Andrew, did you see the same thing for you guys or were you, did you have issues with that? Not really. The very large majority of the places that we sample are actually either outside or in their own isolated building. So we really haven't had any issues getting into places with, you know, added PPE or anything of that nature. However, the inspections have been a little bit more difficult, even just accepting of it. Some people won't allow anyone else on site. And if we need to get on site, it's, it's even more, you know, it's not just questionnaire at some points. And it's, it's been a little bit difficult in that aspect. Maggie, do they do virtual inspections? Are you allowing for that? Like, is that something that, like, if an if if uh, industry isn't allowing people on site for a good reason, if if they work with the coordinator to do a virtual inspection, is that something that EPA is is allowing? I have to choose my words carefully here. Um, allowing isn't the word I would use, but I think you know we stand by you know doing what is safe for your personnel. We don't want anyone putting themselves in a position to put themselves in harm's way or that would cause an issue with their safety. Um, you know, I can speak to, I know I, I can talk what we're doing at EPA and, and this is where, you know, maybe it'll help people understand where we're at. We don't have a lot of people going out on site as well for the sheer fact that a number of the industries we regulate would also not want us, you know, I've had a few discussions with some of them, they don't want us out on site either. Um, so at the moment, we're also supplementing um, our what would normally be an inspection for us with offsite virtual interviews, like I think Andrew was alluding to, but they can only go so far um, and they are not defined as an inspection. That being said, it, it goes back to, you know, doing what you can with your program in during this time, you know, not sitting around ignoring potential issues, but at least making the effort, having the phone calls, documenting those phone calls, documenting any communication you have with your regulated industries, or if industries are having issues, making sure that they're calling their, you know, their pretreatment coordinators at their local facility, local POTW. But the expectation is that, you know, the communication is open that they are talking to their industries, just like out, like what Alex was saying is exactly what I would have most likely expected anyone to do is just, you know, making sure that everyone's aware that people are listening, they're, they're there to have that open line and to know what's going on. I'm actually, I, I kind of want to like throw, throw a question out to, yeah. to everyone in the sense of production changes during COVID. I know, I don't know if that was on any of the, and, and Tori told me to shut up and just like cut it off. But I'm very curious about whether, you know, in which direction production went for, you know, certain industries versus not, or whether that was a big challenge for people to cope with, especially at the plants and especially at the industries. And Andy had a drastic change. I know he can talk about that for sure. 
Yeah, so so we make all the uh, Major League Baseball uniforms for all 30 teams. We supply everything that they wear on field, uh, the uniform, the sweatshirts, T-shirts, jackets, all of that. And, and part of that process, you know, we're screen printing, we're cutting, we're sewing. Um, there were a couple days, I think the governor shut us down uh, March 19th. March 20th, we started. There is communication between our, uh, our the owner of Fanatics, uh, the majority holder, and uh, trying to figure out a way that we could alter what we do and uh, help the, the frontline workers, uh, the hospitals. I know we have Valley Hospital, St. Luke's, you know, we, we, we worked with. Um, within a couple of days, by Wednesday, we were up in production making uh, facial coverings, the cloth face masks. So the Fanatics had, um, they had, uh, promised, and we were able to fulfill that, making one million face, facial coverings. And uh, we didn't. We did, the, the the gowns were were a lot more difficult, uh, just because it took more time and more material. But we were able to take the fabric that was used on the different major league baseball teams. Whether we did a lot with the Phillies to begin with, we did a little a lot of white with red pinstripe and the Yankees and Mets. And, um, and we had fulfilled that order of a million masks uh, across the United States. Uh, we work with a lot of colleges that uh, are collegiate licenses that have uh, affiliations to hospitals, so, you know, out to UCLA. And, and uh, I mean, we had people showing up at our front door. I get a phone call at home on a, on a Saturday or Sunday saying somebody from New York City had driven out here, found our site, and was trying to, to get... Um, uh, face masks for their hospital. So, um, so we we were at about uh, a quarter to a third of our our population being on site, and uh, and that's all we did from uh, the rest of March, April, May, and into June. And once uh, the, the the sports season started opening again, we transitioned back to what we were doing. So our process of what we were doing drastically changed. And you know, we talked cross training. We had a lot of people doing things they didn't normally do. Um, and it just for a temporary purpose, but everybody really came together and, and uh, it worked out pretty well. Uh, we had no cases during that time, no, no COVID cases during that time. So we were up, our production was going and, and uh, you know, actually went very well. That's an amazing story. A question I always have, industries when you're so used to doing one thing and within a couple of days switch over and are doing something else, during those three or four months where you're making masks, uh, making uh, making something new and different, do you guys lose money during that time? Lose a lot of money because you shifted or are you able to price this thing so you're still breaking even? Like what happens with that? You know? Yeah, I mean, it, it, we weren't, uh, there was no sales involved. Everything was uh, was donated, donated. Uh, it was all donations. So uh, all the million masks and the, and the gowns and things that we were providing were all Part of an agreement, they, we partnered with Major League Baseball, and uh, I think they took some costs there as well as we did. So, um, you know, we were pretty blessed to continue working for those of us that, that could continue to work. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was definitely a hit. I mean, we have another side of our business, that's e-commerce. And, uh, you know, that had done pretty well during that time. Um, you know, it, uh, it, it's not something they, they tried to capitalize on, but at the same time, there was a need. And so we, we've been producing a lot of um, masks within the industry um, that are, are um, licensed masks. So, you, you know, we did quite a business with that. But this was all, everything that we did was, was um, uh, to, like I say, frontline. We had a lot of local requests from police, from fire. Um, and so we worked specifically with St. Luke's and then we also connected with, with Leah Valley Hospital. So took care of our local partners as best we could. Um, again, a lot of people knocking on our door, employees that work at a township that had, um, you know, people that are out the road, people, you know, it's people that had to continue working. So, um, yeah, it was a hit, but in the end it was, uh, you know, it was a good thing. And sometimes it's, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> so I congratulate you and your firm. That's amazing. Uh, Maggie had posed a really good question. Uh, changes to your production. Who else saw changes either making new things, increase in production, decrease in production? Who wants to share a story? Uh, Justine, do you mind if I call on you? What was happening? Yeah, I was, I was, I was waiting to see if anybody else was going to raise their hand. <laughs> but um, so for our industry, being that we're in the bread industry and the food industry, um, the pandemic actually, it's, it's kind of weird to talk about it 
but the pandemic actually was good for our business um, because, I mean, when when something like this happens, uh, bread is one of those staples. Um, so we, at the beginning of the pandemic, we could not make enough product um, to stock shelves. I do remember um, going to my local uh, giant and looking at the bread aisle and there were maybe a dozen loaves on the shelves. Um, so uh, production certainly increased for us. Um, we haven't been able to make enough bread um, since the, the pandemic started. So, uh, I mean, I, we make more than just bread. We make uh, um, other products like English muffins and little bites and things like that um, and donuts. Um, but in, in, um, as far as production goes, it certainly has increased. Okay. Uh, and Diana, uh, with the clients you have out there, uh, Lehigh County Authority, what were you seeing as far as production goes uh, on the, I guess, the wastewater side? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. I don't get increased production. I get the effects of increased production. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I, I recently had a meeting with all the industries that, that come into our plant, and um, it seems that bread and beer go hand in hand. So there's... Yep. Hey, everybody's drinking their beer. So Sam Adams, uh, Boston Beer, their their production's gone up quite a bit. Um, the ocean sprays, theirs had gone up a lot, mm -hmm. um, but Coca Cola's had gone down. So for me, it's um, it, a change in the the concentration of what's coming into our plant. So you know what's coming in is is different, stronger in some ways, mm -hmm. weaker in others. Um, slightly more flow than I was getting before. So it it is definitely. Um, causes some changes in how we process and operate here. Um, not a big change. We have a lot of haulers that, that come into this plant. Um, I wouldn't say there was a big change there. Um, they seem to be pretty constant and consistent, um, but the uh, piped in industries were the, were the big change. But food and beverage, you know, that didn't slow down. That didn't stop because of the pandemic. If nothing else, it, it increased. So uh, we're, mm -hmm. we're seeing those effects for sure. Okay. And how are you managing those effects? <laughs> Uh, we're learning a lot um, just about the capabilities of this plant and um, we had to put some systems online that we previously didn't need to have online, uh, sort of shift things around a bit where, where we put some of these waste streams um, as they come in, um, how we get them treated and taken care of. Um, we've worked with um, LCA and the downstream plant in, in an understanding that we're trying to work through these changes to our waste and um, we're, we're actually managing now. It took us a few months to kind of understand and of course biological systems take some time to react and and to those changes. Mm -hmm. So um, this past month or so things have been better even though we're still getting the same strengths coming in we're, we are processing it better and our numbers are are lower than they were but um, we did definitely saw a spike of about two or three months of oh my what are we doing with this and how are we gonna how are we gonna treat this better and differently so that we can um, meet our requirements for the downstream plant and not burden them too much so uh, it seems to be working out excellent uh, so Andrew Moore you're also you Lehigh County Authority right Correct. So uh, I'm so, from the yeah. downstream of Diana. So we're sort of in the same mm -hmm. boat of dealing with that. So with her plant, as she said a little bit earlier, um, so they were struggling a little bit eh, middle of the summer or so. And uh, it seems to be somewhat back to normal, but the vast majority of the industries are, are out her way. So. Okay. Uh, and so any other comments on uh, the, the what were you just talking about? I apologize. Um, and production, production higher or lower? Uh, actually, Katie, I'm thinking for you guys, um, you have way more patients, but different types of patients. So, like, like how did that? How did that affect you guys? Yeah. So at the beginning of everything, we ended up um, halting elective surgeries, and that re that um, we really mm -hmm. saw a dip in a lot of, in a lot of different um, water waste. Uh, recycling all of our different waste streams um, but now that's been up now that we've had you know that we're comfortable with the procedure and protocols and, and safety of everyone um, so I think that goes back to normal but with the higher census um, oh, oh, pretty much always full um, you know we're going to get more more patients more folks 
in the bathroom, in the shower, um, more cafeteria food production. Um, uh, yeah, so although um, like other waste streams are still uh, trending differently than, than in the past, um, I, I, I see water going, going back up with the increase in patient count, hmm. definitely. And Alex, how about you? Uh, any changes in production that you guys noticed? Actually, no. We've been pretty steady across the board the whole time. And I think mainly having more residential people home versus less industry kind of evened out. Okay. Yeah, and I've seen that um, with various utilities, water, wastewater, yeah, the evening out thing. If you're a big enough system, it, yeah, it can even out. So that's interesting. Uh, any other comments on um, the production there? And, and Maggie, phenomenal question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I have another comment then. It's not necessarily production, but I've had multiple requests about like expired products. And since the pandemic, like their products necessarily weren't being sold or couldn't be used anymore. So they were looking to dispose of them. And depending on what it is, it can be a little bit of a struggle. We've experienced it in the past with some of the high concentrated beverages that are, that are out Diana's way. Um, and just disposing them at one time is definitely a no-no. Um, depending on what it is, we really have to evaluate it and see if our plants can, ha can handle such slug loads. Okay, excellent. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience. So thank you so much for submitting those. Uh, we have about 10 minutes less left in this round table, so we can take more questions, use the Q&A button. This one's from H. David Miller with NTech. Uh, he poses it to Maggie. Uh, he says, I've been substituting IU site visits. What's IU? Maggie, do you know what that means? Industrial user. <laughs> IU site visits with phone calls, emails, IU survey updates, as well as monitoring water consumption which is reflective of production changes. Will this suffice? Maggie. <laughs> you can say maybe. <laughs> it depends, we'll go with the John answer. It depends. Um, That's fine. <laughs> I'm gonna default back to, you know, all the, and again, I'll provide the link if um, NTech can send it out um, after the round table to, there is an EPA site that is housing all the, COVID-19, um, you know, enforcement memos, which is really what a lot of these questions are pertaining to, um, so that you can kind of get an idea of, you know, where EPA is at. Um, I just, I maintain communication and documentation. That's what I've been telling anyone who's given me a call or written me an email about activities that they are required to perform on, under the pretreatment program. Um, and as long as you are maintaining that, um, you know, that, that that's the best advice I can give right now. And, and as far as what will suffice, you know, at the end of the day, it's just going to come down to, um, you know, reporting it and enforcement discretion. So. Okay. Yeah, fair answer. Thank you. Another question from our audience. This one's coming from Tom, our sponsor with Arthres. Thank you, Tom. Uh, can you speak to managing wipes? You know, those disposable wipes in sewer systems? What a pain in the ass. <laughs> Every time I pass them in the grocery store, I get angry because they're not disposable. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, with more volume of those, uh, or are, are you seeing more volume of those? What equipment are you using to manage them? Alex, you're shaking your head. What, is, what are you guys doing about that? <laughs> it's a nightmare. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. And honestly, I've been an absolute nightmare. So we have... We're pulling pumps constantly. There's only so much you can do. Our poor guys are out left and right trying to do maintenance on equipment because of these lovely wipes. So yeah, no, it's a nightmare. <laughs> uh, yes, Maggie. I'm, I'm just curious because I'm going to play off of Alex there and maybe Andrew and Diana. Has there been any attempt at outreach in your communities? Because I know living, I live in Philadelphia because um, I work in Philadelphia, but there was outreach at the beginning of COVID and it was lost in a bunch of little fine print paragraphs about, you know, not flushing those wipes because of course everyone's using, you know, the Clorox wipes and other various brands of wipes for their countertops. And of course everyone sees flushable and they think it's flushable, it's not. But I'm curious, mm -hmm. any outreach attempts or of that sort? 
Yes, we did quite a few outreach attempts, whether it be social media, um, newsletters throughout our municipalities. We actually put a pretty graphic photo up on the EAJSA website of a pump that's extremely clogged up with wipes. It's kind of disgusting, but it was hoping to get the point across. But And we sent that out on the newsletters as well. Unfortunately, people don't know. Right, mm -hmm. that, that, that just blows my mind. So I'm always trying to educate just my friends on Facebook, people on LinkedIn, and hoping they'll tell a friend. But like, when you guys are in the grocery store, do you guys go by those disposable white uh, displays? Do you think of taking a Sharpie and like writing non, writing non, or posting signs, please don't flush, It'll, it costs you more money in the long run. Any, anyone ever do that? We won't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone else out there anyone else uh, besides alex doing outreach trying to educate oh, andrew so we've used social media quite often and we've really tried to reach out to some people um back in march when this really started it was it was pretty ugly it seemed to i don't want to say calm down uh but they're it's gotten better uh mm -hmm. we reached out with social media and some of the larger hospitals um extended to care facilities, things of that nature, we've, we've always had problems with wipes. And I don't want to say that it got worse, but there's been a couple situations where, you know, we've had sore backups and it's quite obvious where it's coming from. So we have met with those type of facilities and really tried working with them. And it works for a couple of weeks. You know, you're back in the same boat. It's, it's a very difficult problem to solve. Okay. Anyone else, uh, any, any, um, yeah, Katie. Yeah, I can say internally, um, cause we have like bath in a bag kind of wipes that we've always had problems with. We even have like our own grinders <laughs> to try, but they just get, they just get caught in the wheels. And of course, then we're just mm -hmm. having to clean that out. Um, and even with education, so much education, <laughs> uh, there's still, still issues. Okay. Uh, here's another question from our audience that I will pose. Uh, this is from Jamie Lura with Spot Stevens McCoy. Uh, any of the wastewater treatment plants experiencing issues with the disinfectants and increased cleaning product discharges, uh, issues with biomass kill, foaming during foaming due to surfactants, <laughs> phosphorus increase due to detergents. Um, they, he says we've been seeing this or suspecting it at some of our facilities. So anyone seeing that due to these cleaning, you know, liquids that are being uh, now out into waste? Anyone? <laughs> so you're not having troubles with this? Uh, Alex, go ahead. We've had some foaming substances coming in, but nothing that's affected the plant in a negative way, which is good. So I think they've been dilute enough that we haven't seen too many issues, but we've seen like the physical aspect of them, seeing some foaming, but not actually any bio issues. Okay. Anyone else seeing this sort of thing out there? Yeah. At Allentown, we really haven't had any issues, but I mean, we're usually pushing 33 million gallons a day and it would have to be a pretty, pretty large uh, discharge of some type to really affect us. Okay. And do you think yeah. those issues aren't happening, Andrew and Alex, because of um, the increase in flows because people are home and you said that balance, that dilution is, is affecting, I mean, is that, do you, are you seeing an increase in flows at the plant just because more people are home? No, we're still pretty much leveled out and I still Same. think it's, yep. Yeah, we, we really haven't seen a drastic change at all. Um, I think Alex said a little bit earlier, I think everything just sort of balanced out. You know, you have the people working at their jobs, now they're working from home and still really hasn't changed as far as water usage. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, um, just a heads up. I see we've got about five minutes left for the round table. I wanna go back to that first poll that we sent out to the audience and uh, their number two concern was employee morale. <laughs> and if you guys are like me, you're thinking, God, our, our 20, 2020's been a shit show. And the holidays are coming up. We can't see family. And in more of this for the next four to six months. Employee morale. Anyone have any tips, 
secrets. What are you doing to maintain the morale? <laughs> Katie, you're shaking your head no. So you're probably, you have it worse. So what are you guys doing? I don't, I don't mean that we don't have anything. <laughs> Just that it's, it's really <laughs> difficult, um, especially for the clinicians being on the site, dealing with patients, having to have the mask on for eight to 12 hours a day. Um, but they did do, uh, we did get like a, kind of got a bonus, a bonus PTO day and some cute little Christmas holiday gift. Um, so they're, they're, you know, leadership is, is really trying their best. I, I have to say that. Okay, good. Uh, Diana, what are you seeing out there? Well, um, like I said, I, I have a fairly small staff and, and the way that we broke up the teams, we, we kind of, I mean, I have two mechanics, for example, at the whole plant. So one mechanic is on each shift. So things that they're doing with each other is they're leaving each other, we'll say sanitized gifts, right? So so if they know, because they're, they're, they're friends, right? They've, they're always working together. And now I've split them up and they're not working together anymore. So what they do is they kind of leave each other a little like, hey, keep up the good work kind of gifts to each other. The lab does it. You know, um, and it's random. It's not like every time they have a shift change, but they're just kind of like, hey, you know, miss working with you kind of stuff um, that's keeping them going. And Christmas is around the corner. So I'm trying to be very creative as the manager to come up with something to give these guys that'll, you know, show the appreciation. I know this has been a hard year on everybody. Um, so, uh, yeah, just trying to just trying to keep reminding them that, you know, we're all going through this together. And, and I, I think just having patience with them in general. So if things come up, you know, it's hard to address it when you're the only mechanic here and you're trying your best. And it's like, I, I just keep reminding them, I get it. You know, I, I, I totally understand. You don't want them to be stressing out any more than they already are because they're stressing at home too, right? We're all going home and not really having much to do. And, um, you know, so it, it, it does compound itself sometimes. So just trying to keep it lighthearted and, and just little reminders. And I walk through the lab and I'm like, hey, you're doing an awesome job today. And that seems to make all the difference um, to the staff. So it's just those little things that, that really make it an impact. That's wonderful ideas. Other other people, other firms, what are you guys seeing out there to help with employee morale? Uh, Andrew Schneck, I'm gonna call on you. What are you guys doing? Uh, we had closed down a couple of times and we had the opportunity to, um, you know, kind of between a couple of the, the, the bumps in the road, we just gave them an extra day off. We did have, we, we were paying people uh, a certain dollar amount more per week that, that were working during the, uh, the time where we we're trying to produce the masks. Uh, providing luncheons as best as we could, being socially distant and responsible. Um, so, I mean, those, just some of the small thank yous, now we're pretty much back to normal. So some of those things have kind of ended, but uh, you know, everybody likes a day off, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, excellent. Well, I see we're coming up on noon. So uh, as a wrap up, I want to share, I'll share my screen. Um, Big, big thank you to all of our panelists. So Maggie Green, Diana Heimbach, Andy Schneck, Justine Maurer, Katie Vilecki, Andrew Moore, Alex Hoffman, Corey Morgan, and big thanks to our sponsor, Tom Fuller with EarthRes. Now, I'll leave this up for a moment or two. Um, these guys are passionate about what they do. If you've got questions for them, you've got their email addresses right there, please reach out to them. In addition, I'd mentioned this video, a video of this talk, as well as this wrap up slide will be shared on the PICS website after this. Um, and Tori, you wanna wrap things up with any final words? I'd love to, Christine. Thank you again for helping moderate today's um, event and thank you to all the panelists. Um, on behalf of PIX, we are just super thrilled to have all of you have joined us today and um, looking forward to your survey completion to let us know what you're interested in hearing in the next roundtable, which we hope to have within the coming month. So please fill out the survey. It's very, very important to us to know what you're interested in hearing and stay safe and stay well. And we're glad we could share with you some experiences, good, bad, ugly,
family, whatever it is related to COVID and pretreatment and industry, we're all in this together and we wanna make sure that we remain that way. So use your resources, use the networking. That's what PIX is all about. So visit our website, www.lvpix.org and um, reach out to us. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to hear your thoughts and we'd love for you to get more involved. So thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, everyone have a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.